In this chapter, we will discuss functions. We will also discuss what happens if you multiply or divide monomials, or you take them to exponents or roots, hence exponents. Linear and nonlinear functions. If you graph a linear function, it is a straight line. It has a constant rate of change, so the slope is always the same. So for every amount you go in one direction, horizontally you go the same amount vertically. That doesn't mean the slope is one though. It's not like, oh, you go three units horizontally, you must go three units vertically. No. You go three units horizontally, you go say, I don't know, five units vertically. You go another three horizontally, you go another five vertically. So for every horizontal increment, you get the same vertical change. So, a nonlinear function, the rate of change is not constant. So the graphs are not straight lines. You don't have a constant slope. So the steepness is not the same. Therefore, the line can fluctuate. Now, the equation for a linear function can always be written in the form of y equals mx plus b, where m is the slope, or constant rate of change, and b is the y-intercept, the point at which the graph meets the y-axis. What is the y-axis? Oh, the y-axis is when x equals 0, therefore, uh, what happens when x equals 0? Well, m at x, m times x, must equal 0, and therefore y equals b. That's why b is the uh, y-intercept. So you can determine whether a function is linear by de examining the equation. In a linear function, the power of x is always going to be 1 or 0. If the power of x is 0, then you don't have an x term. It's just y equals some constant value. If the power of x is 1, it's y equals some multiple of x plus some constant value. Now, x cannot appear in the denominator of a fraction if you want your function to be linear. Unless the fraction itself cancels out. And even then, you may have points that you have to remove from the graph because otherwise you would end up with a divide by zero, specifically a zero divided by zero problem. For example, if your graph is y equals 3x over x, then x cannot equal zero, even though the whole thing cancels out to y equals 3. You would have a horizontal line, and then a removable discontinuity at x equals 0. There is no y value at that point. All right, let's look at this example. Determine whether this graph represents a linear or a nonlinear function. And explain. It's not a straight line, therefore nonlinear. Not a straight line. Thus, nonlinear. Nonlinear. Now determine whether y equals 2.5x represents a linear or nonlinear function. Well, for every one unit x increases how, or decreases, how many units does y increase or decrease if x is decreasing? Oh, 2.5. So you have, say, 0, 0, 1, 2.5. 2, 5, and so on. Yeah, uh, this is a constant slope. We see that x is here to the power of 1. The 1 is hidden, though, because it gets kind of annoying writing all the 1s. <coughs> Otherwise, you would be like, y to the power of 1 equals 2.5x to the power of 1. No. 
mathematicians do in fact like to figure out how to make their own lives easier by writing less. Even if you might have a hard time figuring that out from all the proofs you, mathematical proofs you may have seen before. Hmm. Well, anyway, this is linear. The power of x, power of x and y are both 1 or 0. Because remember, if it was just y equals some constant, that's x to the power of 0. Now, if y doesn't show up, that's still fine. Because x equals 3 is going to plot on a graph as, well, a straight line. A straight vertical line. X equals 3, right? Uh, actually, that's not a... The, the problem is that's a relation, but it's not considered a function. A function has one range value for each domain value. The domain is plotted on the horizontal axis. So if for that one domain value, i.e. x equals 3, you have infinite range values, that's not actually a function. Just saying. But it would be a linear relation. Anyway. Oh yeah, another thing is that the power of y being 1, uh, usually you're not asked to state this because it's kind of assumed at this level, but imagine if it was y squared equals 2.5x. Well, if you actually want to represent y, you would have root of 2.5x, which would not be linear. Speaking of root of 2.5x, we're going to be doing those roots a little later. For now, let's talk more about linear or nonlinear functions. Okay, determine whether the table represents a linear or nonlinear function. Well, this is what? Plus 1. This is plus 1. This is also plus 1. Okay, what happens with the denominator? Plus 2. Plus 2. Plus 2. Okay, so for every equal change in x, there is a corresponding change in y that is matching in magnitude for each identical change of x. So, rate of change of change of y with respect respect to x is constant. Ergo, linear. Okay. Let's try some exercises. Determine whether each graph, equation, or table represents a linear or nonlinear function. Explain. Does this look like a straight line? No, therefore, it is nonlinear. Now remember, if for any domain value there is more than one range value, then it's not a function. You would have to say relation. But for now, we're just looking at linear versus nonlinear functions, so uh, we don't care for that much. y equals 2 minus 3x. Well, this is slope y-intercept form, although it would be, say, minus 3x plus 2. This is linear. Here, for every increase of 1x, you have an increase of 2 in y, therefore this is linear. Yeah, I'm just explaining verbally. So, here, uh, we go minus 
x is increasing by 1 at a time. So here we go minus 2, plus 2, plus 2. Oh dear, the y changes are not the same, whereas the x changes are the same. Therefore, this is nonlinear. Linear. Graphing quadratic functions. A quadratic function such as a equals s squared or b equals z squared or y equals x squared is a function where the greatest power of the variable is 2. The graph is kind of u-shaped. It's actually called a parabola. It opens upward or downward. Let's do some examples. Graph y equals negative 0.2x squared. Well, at x equals 0, y equals 0. Okay. At x equals 1 or negative 1, y is negative 0.2. Now, x equals 2, y equals at point 0.8 x equals 3 or negative 3, y is going to be negative 0 0.2 times 9 or negative 1.8. And 4, 0 0.2 times, well negative 0 0.2 times 16 is 3.2. And if x is plus minus 5, you're going to end up with negative 0 0.2 times 25, which is going to be negative 5. Okay, so you would sketch your curve. If you're using pencil, you have the luxury of doing a lot of tiny little increments. Unfortunately, my equipment does not afford me said luxury, so I kind of have to do it all in one go. The result is rather predictably not exactly going to win any art prizes anytime soon. Yeah, this is why you should use A, use pencil for graphs, and B, for these curves, you should do the multiple little scritches technique, or whatever it's called. Kind of like just shading the line into existence. As you can see, the uh, rate of change accelerates rapidly as you get away from the vertex of the parabola. Graph y equals x squared minus 2. Well, that's going to be here. And plus minus 1 is going to be giving you 1 here. So negative 1. And then... 4 minus 2, and after that it just goes right, one quarter here. Yeah, uh, as you can see, this is why a lot of the graphing problems will either give you a distorted y-axis, so make the uh, x-axis actually get fully used, or they will move the curve around a bit to give you a little bit more use on the x-axis, or they just give you a multiplier on the x-squared term that compresses the shape by giving it a multiplier that's between negative 1 and 1, and usually relatively close to 0. So. If you need, and you probably should to start with, it is strongly recommended that you do this. So negative 3, y is going to be 9 minus 2, which is 7. Negative 2, 2, negative 1, 1 minus 2, so negative 1, 0, negative 2, 1, 1, 
Well, this is the sort of short table that you're kind of expected to use when you're first starting out on this type of problem. You would then plot the points where you can, and then fill in the curve. Just remember that the vertex is not very pointed. It's actually pretty rounded. All right, let's do some exercises. Let's graph a few more. You can do that sort of vertical XY table, or you can do it horizontally. X and Y. So, uh, let's see. Uh, if we do, say, negative 5 squared, that's 25. And then we multiply by 0.25, we would end up with 6.25. And then minus 5. Yeah, okay, that's within our vertical boundaries. Then we start at, say, negative 5. You end up with 1.25. Negative 4. You would end up with, well, 16 times 0.25 or 4 times 1. So 4 minus 5 gives you negative 1, negative 3 gives you 0.25 times 9, so 2.25 minus 5, minus 2.75, minus 2, yeah, 4 times 0.25, that's just 1, minus 5, that's negative 4, negative 1 gives you Negative 4.75 and 0 gives you negative 5. Hey, given that this is just x squared, what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that 0, x equals 0, is a line of symmetry. And plus minus 1 squared comes out to the same thing. Therefore, really, what we wrote here is this. Which, by the way, is probably why we uh, might want to consider starting with zero and going to either side. If the axis of symmetry is indeed zero. How can you tell? Well, you look at the thing that's being squared and you go, hey, how do we get 0 squared? And where does, do we end up getting plus 1 squared, minus 1 squared? So same thing. Later on, you're going to end up with, say, x minus a squared. And then some multiplier. The specific letters that you use to represent what happens don't actually matter. Uh, but this sort of thing, the axis of symmetry, would be at x equals a. Because there you would have 0 squared and 1 to either side. You would have 1 squared, 2 to either side. You'd have 2 squared or negative 2 squared, same thing. So yeah, uh, that we can cover later though. So let's plot these points. Hmm. 5, negative 4, and 2.75, negative 1, and 1.25. So this, the curve drawing on this equipment is unfortunately not great, uh, but you can get the idea. Remember when you draw yours to please use a pencil and use the uh, many, uh, I guess you can call it shading in technique for the lines.
All right, y equals negative 0.1x squared minus 2. You do the same old thing, which is either vertical or horizontal tally. x equals 0, because 0 is the axis of symmetry here, guys. Remember, it's got to be, say, x minus something in the bracket squared before you move the axis of symmetry anywhere else. Or what else? Hmm. You could also have something x squared plus something x because that would skew your parabola. And, well, actually that uh, you can factor out and complete the square and you can find that it actually is just x plus something squared, like all in a bracket, squared, and then with some other constant modifiers. But for our purposes, oh, that's too complicated and it's in the future still. So for zero, we have y equals negative two for plus minus one, because there's no other x terms except the x squared. For plus minus one, we have negative 0 0.1 minus 2, so negative 2.1 plus minus 2. You would have negative 2.4 plus minus 3 is negative 2.9 plus minus 4 is, well, negative 1.6 minus 2, so negative 3.6. plus minus 5, that comes out to negative 2.5 minus 2, negative 4.5. Okay, so let's plot these points. And negative 3.6, that's around here-ish. So yeah, it's just plot the points after you calculate them and then sketch the curve as best as your equipment permits. All right, graphing quadratic functions. You can always use a four-step plan to solve a problem. You determine what's given and what is required. You select a strategy of some sort, including a possible estimate. And then you solve the problem by carrying out your plan and then you check the answer to see if it makes sense. Like, how much does this uh, bag of peanuts weigh? If you come out with an uh, answer that's, say, 3,000 kilograms, and this is not like a truckload of peanuts, no. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Let's say Jean is trying to make a box out of a piece of cardboard by cutting a square out of each corner. She will then fold up the sides and tape them together. The cardboard measures 5 feet 6 inches by 9 feet 6 inches. She wants a box to measure 3 feet wide by 7 feet long. What size squares should Jean cut out of the corners to make the box? Well, if you're making this box, you have these flaps that you got from cutting square corners out, right? According to the problem. So we give ourselves a little sketch of the situation and we need to figure out what X is. And we know that this is a three feet wide box and a seven foot long box and Hey, wait a second. Three feet plus two X equals five feet six inches. Two X equals five foot six inches minus three feet, which is equal to two feet six inches. Uh, X is equal to one foot three inches. Okay. Well, what we also know, well, we also know 
that 2x is equal to 9 foot 6 inches minus 7 feet. Therefore, 2x is equal to 2 foot 6 inches and x equals 1 foot 3 inches. Okay, the question checks out. So the x values we need, the side lengths of the square that we need, they match the conditions given in the question. It is possible to cut these squares. It is possible to cut these squares. Squares with side length. Side length. 1 foot 3 inches. 3 foot wide by 7 feet long. What sh could she possibly be putting in this? Uh, if this is particularly strong cardboard, you could... I don't know, shove a small mattress inside it and that's a bed. Or you can shove enough fluff inside it, put a cloth on top and that's a bed, I guess. Uh, I mean, there's no lid, so I don't think it's a coffin, even though it's about the right depth to be a coffin. Hmm. Don't overthink these problems. A lot of them just no. No, they lead places that are like, yeah. So, uh, let's make some models and solve some problems. We have a guinea pig pen. A guinea pig is a type of rodent. It grows quickly, it reproduces quickly, like all other rodents, and it is quite edible. It is part of traditional Andean cuisine dating from back before uh, contact between Old World and New World. That's uh, why it's called a guinea pig, because it was raised kind of like pigs were raised. Now th this is uh, an animal that is lower in fat content and healthier than most larger animals, the meat. But, for some reason, in many places, it's not exactly popular to eat what looks like a very large mouse. Or hamster. So a guinea pig pen will be 5 meters long and 3 meters wide. One side that is 5 meters long will be formed by the barn, and the other three sides will be made of wire fencing with posts at every corner and every 1 meter between each corner. How much fencing and how many posts are needed to build the pen? Well, let's sketch ourselves a little diagram. Barn. Three meters, three meters, and five meters. How many posts do you have along the three meter sections? So you have one, two, three posts. Along the five meters, you have well, you divide it into five chunks of one meter each, and between those, there are going to be four posts to separate the pieces. Like, between five tables, there are going to be four gaps if the tables are lined up all in a row. Think about it. Like, you have one person sitting at the first table, they put their right arm out. How many arms will be raised so that the whole table has every person touching another person, at least one other person, because they're also getting touched if they're not the person on the leftmost side. Well, you would only need four arms to be stuck out. The last person can just sit there and be touched. Yeah, so, how many posts are needed to build the pen? Well, 
by the diagram, diagram, you need 3 meters plus 3 meters plus 5 meters equals 11 meters of fencing and 3 meters plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 is 10 posts are needed. Now it should be noted that because it was every corner and every one meter between each corner and all of these are whole numbers, you could have said, oh, we might as well just stretch the fencing, fencing out from barn attached end to barn attached end. There's 11 meters, therefore we need 10 posts in total. What is the fewest number of one inch cubes you need to make a rectangular prism that measures five inches by five inches by six inches? If the prism can be hollow inside as mentioned, that means we need to find how many pr cubes we need to make a full prism, i.e. not hollow inside, and we subtract the part that's hollow. So this is going to be 5 by 5 by 6 minus 3 by 3 by 4. So 5 by 5 is 25 by 6 is 150 minus 3 by 3 by 4. 3 by 3 is 9. 4 times 9 is 36. So that's going to be 114. Full prism minus hollow part. This is the number of one inch cubes you need to have the outer shell. What if we're not satisfied with the highest power of the variable being two? Well, it could be three or four or five or whatever, really. But a cubic function has the highest power of the variable being three. You can graph cubic functions by making a table of values just like you can do with quadratic functions. There is a problem though. For example, here, y equals negative x to the third power. Uh, if we had x and y, we would go from, say, negative 2 to 2x, but then that would g only give us three points that are found within this negative 5 to 5 range for y values. Now y here is negative 2 to the third power is negative 8 and then negative again so 8. To not make our uh, curves extremely awkward to plot we have to use points in between such as a negative 1.5 so 1.5 to the third power 3.375 yeah so 3.375 negative 1 to the third power and negative would be, give us a 1 and then negative 0.5 0 0.125, 0, 0, 0, 0.5, negative 0 0.125, and so on. 1, negative 1, 1 1.5, negative 3.375, 2, and negative 8. Yeah, uh, you would plot all the points you could here, and then you would make the curves. Of course, if you have a graphing calculator, it is much more convenient. However, you still need to know how to do this manually.
after all, sometimes you don't have a graphing calculator and you still have to figure something out by yourself. Hmm. So you need to know how to do this. So x to the third minus one, well this is negative x to the third, so we flip this across the x-axis, flip it over, and then it says minus one, so we shift it down by one. Now if we do a vertical compression to one quarter as much, you can see that it doesn't seem to occupy that much more of the domain within the range of negative 5 to 5 than it did before. Yeah, uh, x to the third very rapidly grows very large in magnitude. x to the fourth more so and so on. Such is the power of exponents. Now let's say we want to multiply powers. Well, the product of powers property tells us that to multiply powers with the same base, we just add the exponents. So a to the power of n times a to the power of m is a to the power of n plus m. Why is this? Well, this is a times a times a, so there's n number of a's, and this is multiplying by another string of m a's. M A's. So M times A's. And then we have James A times dot 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 times A N times A's. So in total we have N plus M. A's. The x here is being used as a how many times this thing occurs, like shows up. Okay, so multiply, express using exponents. Well, 2 to the third by 2 to the second is equal to 2 to the 3 plus 2. For this level, we state this, and then it's 2 to the fifth. Needless to say, very quickly you uh, escape having to do such things. Uh, what happens if we have uh, coefficients? Well, this is equal to negative 2 times s to the 6 times negative 7 times s to the 7th. That means we can rearrange this to give us 14 s to the 13th, or 6 plus 7th. Yeah, I'm abbreviating that step out. So n to the fifth times n to the thir negative third is equal to n to the five minus three which is equal to n to the fifth divided by n to the third. By the way, we'll be doing that shortly. So that's n squared. Alright, let's do some exercises. Multiply these and express using exponents. 3 to the 4th times 3 to the 1st is 3 to the 4 plus 1, or 3 to the 5th. And then 5 squared times 5 to the 5th equals 5 to the 2 plus 5, or the 7th. e to squared times e to the 7th, that's e to the 2 plus 7, or 9th. And... 2a to the 5th times 6a, well that's 2 times 6, which is 12, and then a to the 5 plus 1, which is 6 power. Negative 3t to the 3rd times 2t to the 8th, that's negative 6t to the 11th. 4 times negative 5 is negative 20, multiply the coefficients and multiply the variables separately. x squared times x to the 6th is x to the eighth. Now, negative six t to the fourth times negative three t to the fifth. Hmm, usually you see a uh, 
bracket around negative signs if they follow immediately after another operator, but, well, sometimes teachers will leave them like that just to troll you. So, negative 6 times negative 3 is 18. And then t to the 4th times t to the 5th is t to the 4 plus 5, or 9. And here you would end up with 3 quarters to the power of negative 3 plus 6, which is 3 quarters to the power of 3. Negative 6m squared times 4m. Negative 6 times 4 is negative 24. And m to the third. 3s to the sixth times negative 9s negative 2h squared. That's going to be 3 times negative 9 or negative 27. s to the power of 6 minus 2 or 6 plus negative 2. So s to the fourth h squared. And here, once again, you multiply the coefficients negative 54, and then a squared times a to the negative fifth gives you a to the 2 minus 5, or negative 3, and this is negative 2 times 6, negative 12, e to the power of 4 minus 6, e to the negative 2, and z to the negative fourth, because there's no other z's to multiply in. All right, let's say we want to divide monomials. Well, dividing, we subtract the exponents. Because a to the power of n divided by a to the power of m is equal to a to the power of n times a to the power of negative m. So, Let's do some examples such as k to the 8th divided by k. Well, this is equal to k to the power of 8 minus 1 equals k to the 7th. Or 28g to the 12th divided by negative 4g to the 3rd. The coefficients divide separately, giving us negative 7. And g to the 12th minus 3 which is negative 7g to the 9th. Five to the eighth divided by five to the negative fifth is five to the eight minus negative five. So oh, that's five to the thirteenth. Now, Let's do some more divisions and express them using exponents. 2 to the 8th divided by 2 to the 6th, that's 2 to the power of 8 minus 6, which is 2 squared. 7 to the 9th divided by 7 to the 3rd is 7 to the power of 9 minus 3, which is 7 to the 6th v to the 14th divided by v to the 6th is v to the power of 14 minus 6, or v to the 8th. 15 w to the 7th divided by 15 w squared, while well, the 15s cancel out, so you might be used to say canceling as well, so w squared can cancels out 2 up here, but that's just w to the 7 minus 2, isn't it? Yeah, so that's w to the 5th. 21 divided by 7 gives us 3. z to the 10th divided by z to the 9th is z. Well, I mean, z to the 10 minus 9, but yeah, that's just 1. So, 10m to the 8th divided by 2m gives us 5m to the 7th. And then you have stuff like Negative 12 to the third power over 3. Hmm. How could we solve this? Well, this is equal to negative 4 
to the third power times 3 to the third power over 3. So it's negative 4 to the third power times 3 squared. C to the 20 divided by C to the 13 is C to the 20 minus 13 or just C to the 7th. 1 to the 8th power divided by 1 to the 6th power is 1 to the 8 minus 6th power, which is 1 squared. x to the negative 2 divided by x to the negative 4 is equal to x to the negative 2 minus negative 4, or negative 2 plus 4, x squared. 100 to the 7th over 100 to the 6th is, is 100 to the power of 1. You usually don't have to write the power of 1, though. So, 4 to the negative 2 divided by 4 to the 6, that's 4 to the power of negative 2 minus 6, or negative 8. Let's say we want to take our monomial, so one term with no additions or subtractions of other things mixed in, and we want to find powers of it. Well then, to find the power of a power, you multiply the exponents. Because what happens if you have n times a's multiplied together, so a to the power of n, and then multiply it to the mth power? Well, you have m times n times a's showing up multiplied together. Uh, by the way, this uh, is just illustrative, this bracket. It's not any particular notation. So this would be a to the power of n to the mth power is equal to a to the power of mn, or nm. Usually we write the variables in alphabetical order. Okay, simplify to find the power of the power. 5 to the 3rd to the 6th power, well, that's going to be 5 to the 3 times 6 equals 5 to the 18th power. Negative 3 m squared n to the 4th to the 3rd power is going to be negative 3 to the 3rd power m 2 times 3 n 4 times 3. So that's going to be negative 27 m to the 6th power n to the 12th power. Let's say we got to simplify some examples. 4 to the 3rd power to the 5th power is going to be, well, it's 5 4 to the 3rds multiplied together. So how many 4s would be multiplied together? That would be 3 in each group, and there are 5 groups, there are 4 15. That's where the rules came from. 4 to the 3 by 5 equals 4 to the 15th. 4 squared to the 7th power, 4 to the 2 times 7, or 14th power. 9 to the squared to the 4th gives you 9 to the 8th power. k to the 4th squared gives you k to the 4 times 2, or just 8th power, 6 to the 3rd squared, and then squared again gives you 6 to the 3rd times 2 squared, but then that's just a times 2 again. So, it's 6 to the 12th power. And 3 squared, squared again, And then cubed, well, it's just you multiply the chain and you end up with 3 to the 12th power. 
let's say we got a few more variables in there. Well, then, this would be 5 to the 5th, q to the 4 times 5, or 20th, r to the 10th. And this here would be 3 to the 6th, y 2 times 6 is 12th, z 2 times 6 is 12th. And this would be 7 squared, a to the 4 times 2 is 8th, b 3 times 2 is 6th, and c 7 times 2 is 14th. Now for this, negative 4 squared, you know guys, we could write this into 4 squared, right? Uh, I don't recommend it. Because you want to make sure your teachers know that you know exactly how these rules work. d to the 3 times 2, or 6, and e to the 5 times 2, or 10th. And here, negative 5 to the 7th. Yeah, uh, more worryingly, if you get into a habit of taking off the negative sign for even powers, you might accidentally do it for odd powers too, which would go, of course, very, very badly. Yeah, okay. G to the 4 times 7, or 28th, and H to the 9 times 7, so 63rd. 4 to the power of 3 to the power of 5 is 4 to the 3 times 5, or 15th. Now let's say that instead of wanting to have monomials multiplying each other a bunch of times, so taking the power of them, we wanted to find, say, the square root, or the cube root. Well, the square root is one of the two equal factors of the monomial in North America, we assume that the square root is the positive square root. However, in many countries, such as, say, China, like, say, square root 4 equals 2. This is in North America, and as far as I'm concerned, in most of the English-speaking world, as far as I'm aware. However, in places like, say, China, or probably most of East Asia, or many other places. Many places. A square root defaults to the positive and negative root. A root to an even power defaults to positive and negative roots. A root to an odd power however, is, well, all, always specific. So, simplify root 25a4. Well, how do we get 25a4 from squaring something? We can have plus minus 5, and then a to the second power. All right? Yeah, uh, when we're doing these problems, for now, we want to think of this as root 25 times root a4. Like, we're doing this separately, and then we get this. Okay? This is important. And in many countries, you would have to write plus minus 5a2 squared. We're going to go by the North American Convention, though. Just because it's simpler. So this is equal to root 49 times root y to the 6, z to the 8th. You can even separate these two if you like. So you can have root y to the 6, root z to the 8th. So this would be plus minus 7 in my educational background. Probably because I did a lot of Asian problem sets as well as North American. Uh, but in North America, this is just 7. Y to the 3rd. Z to the 4th. The cube root, 
of a monomial is one of the three equal factors of a monomial. For example, how do you get something cubed equals d to the sixth? Oh, that something has to be d squared. So the cube root of d to the sixth is d squared. As you can see, what actually happens is that the cube root is equal to doing this. The square root would be to the power of one half. So, let's say we gotta take this thing and find the cube root. Well, that's equal to the cube root of 125 which by the way is 5, times the cube root of m to the 9th and to the 12th. So 5, m, 3, and 4. And now let us simplify some expressions. Like say, square root of x squared. Hmm. I wonder what this could possibly be. Oh, this is equal to x squared to the power of one half. This is the one way you can think about it. Think about these roots. And you would naturally then get x to the power of one. Yeah, this is why it's so emphasized in, say, the Chinese curriculum that it's plus minus x. Because if you just do the exponents multiplying, you miss the fact that it could also be negative. However, in North America, unless it's stated that it's plus minus root something, you don't treat it as such. Okay. Square root of 4q to the a. Root 4. And then q to the eighth to the power of one half. Therefore, this is 2q to the fourth. This thing, which is 4. And then we have each of the exponents. So c to the fourth, d to the sixth. As you can see, I am abbreviating steps as we go after I've shown you this is how you think. 40, root 49, oh, that's 7, or plus root minus 7, technically. M, 6, and 10th, yeah, those are square rooted as well. M to the 3rd and to the 5th. Root 100, R4, S4, well, that's equal to 10. R squared, S squared, and root 144, D squared, E to the 12th, that's 12, d e to the 6th. Now, what about to the cube root? Well, remember guys, that's equivalent to saying to the one-third power. Which, unlike the square roots, cube roots don't come with a plus minus anywhere because Negative 2 cubed is not equal to 2 cubed. The negatives don't cancel out. All right. So cube root of 27 is 3 because 3 times 3 is 9 and 3 times 9 is 27. And m to the 15th to the 1 third power gives you m to the 5th, so 1 third the exponent. This is equal to 6 by 6 by 6, 6, and then a to the 3rd power, b to the 7th. And this, well, 4 times 4 is 16, 4 times 16 is 64, so you end up with 4, y to the 12th, cube rooted gives you y to the 4th, so 1 third is much the exponent, and z to the 8th. 343 is 7 cubed. 
How do I know this from playing a certain game series at some point? Also, because uh, 7 by 7 is 49, 7 by 9 is 63, 7 by 4 is, yeah. Okay. So this is 7. And then t to the 1 third as much as 18 is 6. u, 6 divided by 3 is 2. And 125 is just 5 to the third power, so 5. p to the 15 divided by 3 is 5. And q... The 27 divided by 3 is 9. Yeah. So, as we can see, functions often relate to monomials. And we kind of need to know what happens when we take monomials and multiply them or divide them. And what happens if we have a bunch of the same monomial multiplying by itself? Or if we want to find out the converse, i.e. the roots. Perhaps it's a square root, perhaps it's a cube root. Or you could even say, go to the fourth root, or the fifth root, or the sixth root. It doesn't really matter. The methods are universal. Come to think of it, that's probably why North American curricula uh, don't use the square root as both positive and negative convention. It's to make the operations more universal instead of distinguishing between even and non-even roots. Well, that's it for this chapter, so see you next chapter.